year 1798 was not notable for the newly formed United States of America. John Adams was president, Thomas Jefferson vice president. In Hampton, Connecticut, just outside New Haven, a machinist named Eli Whitney, who had invented an apparatus for cleaning cotton called the cotton gin, was trying to persuade the southern plantation owners it could do the work of 50 slaves. Orders trickled in from the south, two from Georgia, one from the Carolinas. Have your men make haste there, else we shall lose the tide. Is that the last of them? Yes, Mr. Sefton, it is. Good. Glad to see we're shipping a few gins anyway. As one of the backers of this business, I can tell you we're scraping the bottom of the barrel just to keep going. I'm sure Mr. Whitney appreciates that. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Can you tell me where I can find Mr. Eli Whitney? In his office. This way, sir. Thank you. Whitney? Mr. Jefferson. Come in, come in. Did you just come from Philadelphia? No, Boston. As you're so close to the post road, I thought I'd pay you a little visit. I have one of your cotton gins on my plantation, you know. Works very well, too. Well, I have you to thank for it, helping me get the patent. <laughs> this is an unofficial and private visit, Whitney. I've been through all New England, talking to the ship owners. The situation on the high seas is very bad. Going to get worse. France is firing on all ships leaving our ports, trying to keep us from trading with England. I've heard that. A lot of our local boys sail those ships. We've reached the point where we have to fight for freedom of the seas. It may even lead to war. Oh, I hope not. So do I. But we've got to be strong. Strong enough to convince other nations that we are capable of protecting our shipping. And to do that, we must have arms. Cannon. Muskets by the thousand. That's why I've come to you. But why me? I, I'm not a military man. You could manufacture muskets. But I know nothing about muskets, Mr. Jefferson. I've, I've given all my time to the cotton gin. A man who can invent a machine to do the work of 50 slaves should be able to devise another to do the work of 50 musket makers. Oh, it isn't that simple. You speak of the cotton gin as, as an accomplished fact. The truth is, I have obligations, deep obligations. I've borrowed money. I've made promises to my men. And now, when, when I feel in my heart that cotton gin is finally going to succeed, you ask me to give it up. I'm sorry, but it's more than I can do. I understand perfectly. Whitney, we're a young country. We must prosper and grow, but today we're in grave danger. If we are to survive, we must call on men with initiative and daring, men who think in big terms. You, Whitney, are such a man. I'm sorry, Mr. Jefferson, but I can't see my way in this. You must take time to think it over. I don't expect you to decide immediately. We'll hear from you. They're saying in Philadelphia, millions for defense, but not one cent for tribute. And they're right. Will our country let freedom perish? Are our sons and brothers no longer safe on the high seas? Who is France that she should threaten and seize our shipping? Try to impress What's our happened? seamen. The New Haven Queen went down with all hands. No, neighbors. That's Jonathan Stepson's power. ship. Joel Seymour's boy was the mate. Aye, Stepson and Joel are inside now, comforting each other. Take a stand. Let no man flinch. We've gained liberty. Shall we lose all now because of faint hearts? I, cowardice in our midst, who is there among us who will not fight to the last drop of his blood to maintain our rights before the world? I, patriots, surely to this cause. I came as soon as I heard. Glory over dishonor, of freedom over servitude, and of victory over death. It isn't the cargo I think about. Ned Seymour, Jack Prescott, Adam Hathaway, all those New Haven boys on my ship. He was going to sign off, stay home. You were going to have him work here. Isn't there some way to stop this? I don't know.
thousands of muskets. Thousands of muskets. Thousands of muskets. The money you gentlemen have loaned me during the last two years has made the cotton gin possible. Your faith and patience have brought us to this moment. We have just received our first large order for 100 gins from the Carolinas. Good, oh, wonderful. In another six months, I had planned to pay at least one third of my debts to you. What do you mean, had planned to pay? I'm giving up the manufacture of the cotton gin for an indefinite period. What? You aren't serious. I'm going to make flintlock muskets for the government. You've let those firebrands talk you into this. You know there's not going to be a war. You know it as well as I do. I had a talk with the vice president. If you'd keep your infernal ships off of the high sea, you're a landowner. What right have you to tell me how to run my business? Oh, stop arguing, you two. Now, sir, what crazy idea is this? Our country is threatened. We have to recognize this. There's no reason for us to get involved in a war. It's tomfoolishness. Surely you can put the safety of the country above everything else, Goodrich. You fought in the revolution. Oh, that's another thing. No man can accuse me of not standing up for the country. Talk to any seaman and you'll find out how near war we are. You know we could take all this away from you if you stop making cotton gins. Yes. But I don't think you will. Well, what are you going to do about money? That's for the government to decide. Do I have your approval? Well, it's going to be hard for me. You're the one who stands to profit the most if your ships are protected. I didn't say I wasn't going along. With Jefferson asking us to do this, I don't believe we should refuse. I'll go along. Well, I don't like it. I don't see the sense to it. But uh, count me in. Stepson? Good. I felt certain you'd stand by me. So certain, I posted a letter to the Secretary of the Treasury yesterday morning. What's that? I have a copy of the letter. Perhaps I'd better read part of it to you. Should an actual war take place or the communications between the United States and the West Indies continue to be as hazardous and precarious as it now is, my business of making a patent machine for cleansing cotton must, in the meantime, be postponed. I should like to undertake the manufacture of 10 or 15,000 stand of arms. Why, this Eli Whitney must be a madman. Other musket makers talk in dozens, a few in hundreds. And he talks in thousands. I had hoped to find such a man. The government can't afford to try every harebrained scheme that comes along. It would drain the treasury dry. He isn't harebrained. I think if he's willing, we should share the risk with him. But this is the people's money. We, we can't throw it away. We're in a position where we have to take risks. Then at least let us protect ourselves. If this Whitney feels so sure of himself, let him put up a bond to be forfeited if he fails. I think Whitney is just the man to accept such a challenge. Eli Whitney took up the challenge and commenced the first of many steps to transform his little factory into a plant for making flintlock muskets. There were new tools to make, and most important of all, new men to hire men skilled in the art of musket making. All right, now, men. There are the parts. Most of you are familiar with them. My contract with the government is for 10,000 stand of arms. 10,000? <laughs> you gonna hire us the rest of our life, Mr. Whitney? <laughs> well, I'm getting out. Maybe my son can take over. He's nearing seven now. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Whitney, you better give that contract back to the government. Just making all the parts for the lock assembly is a hard enough job, and the frizzle, you can make ten of them before you can get one that's tempered and shaped right, can't you? Never had any use for firearms. I don't know what a frizzle is. Look. This is the part the flint strikes to make the spark. That's what explodes the powder. It's the heart of the musket, you might say. Oh. Do you see this? Do you see this? The frizzle blew to pieces on me once and put out my eye. That's how I lost it. Then I'll appoint you to work on the frizzle. What are you getting at, Whitney? I'm to work on that alone? That's right. 
I want you to develop a machine or a tool that will turn out not one prison, but 10,000 all alike. Oh, one man can't do that. Each of you will work on a different part. In other words, men, I didn't bring you here to make muskets, but to make the parts for muskets by machines. Then any hammer will fit any lock. Any lock will fit into any stock. Each part will be interchangeable. And assembling a musket will take minutes instead of months. Eli, you're out of your mind. It can't be done. And I've been making muskets for 30 years. <laughs> no man's going to tell me how to do my job. How many do you average in a year? Around six, mostly five. You? Oh, two or three, but I got other chores to do. You? Well, I could turn out six if I had nothing else to do. All right, that's 14 muskets a year between three of the best musket makers in New England. Now, you know what the situation between France and this country is. Whether we like it or not, we're near war. Now, how far would 14 muskets go? We all want the best for the country, don't we? Now, all I ask of you men is help. Some folks didn't think we was going to win the revolution until we done it. I'll go along with me. You can, I reckon I can. No, you can. Time went on. The men worked night and day. Whitney was with them constantly, suggesting here, encouraging there. He did the work of all of them. I'll not mince words with you. You talk good rich Stebson and me into posting a bond for you. It will be forfeit if you don't deliver the first 4,000 muskets to the government in 60 days. I know that as well as you do. And you have yet to put one musket together. You're making all of us look like ninnies backing you to the limit. And so far, nothing to show for it. Nothing? Come with me, Hill House. Is that nothing? Nothing. A perfect part. Parts, parts. The government isn't paying for parts. They want muskets. They're sending Captain Van Gant from the War Department down here to see what we've accomplished. Now, you'd better have something more than that to show him. They'll get Talbot. I'm through. I said it wouldn't work. I knew it wouldn't. Hold on, I Talbot. I told you it wouldn't work. You can't make a prison that way. Nobody can. But you were so close the last Close. Time. Fifty-three times I've had one fail on me. There's not a machine on earth that'll do it. Oh, I want my wages and get out of here before I'll go crazy. As, as crazy as you, Whitney, and all of you. What good are all those parts you make if you can't make the powder flash in the pan? He is right, Whitney. I'm ready to quit myself. How about you, men? Get out. Uh, let's go. Get out, of here. get out, all of you, before I throw you out. I'll show you whether a machine can make a perfect prison. Quit if you want, but get out and leave me alone. I told you to get out. I mean it. Get out before I throw you out with my own hands. He's been in there two days and a night now without food. Hey, look. We got company. This is Captain Van Gant of the War Department. He demands to see Mr. Whitney. I'm sorry, sir, but my order is to keep that door closed. You can't refuse me. I have a right to see how the government's money is being handled. I take my order straight from Mr. Whitney, and he said nobody. Mr. Whitney leaves us no alternative but to post this order to the court. If he can't pay his debts and won't let either the government or his creditors into the factory, he'll have to quit. your help, Joel. No, you don't, Whitney. Anything you do, you do in front of us and Captain Van Gant, representing the War Department. Well, since it was Vice President Jefferson's idea, any emissary from the government should be welcome on this occasion. I think I have a perfect prison. Unfortunately, I won't know for sure until I try one out. They haven't got the right to see the musket until you've tried it. They'll want you to fire it, and it might be dangerous. No, Joel. Come in, all of you. Thank you. 
Captain Van Gant, you are about to see the assembling of a musket, the first of the 10,000 I agreed to make. I call my method of manufacture uniform production. First, here is a bin with musket stocks. Will you pick one out of the bin? Anyone? I came to be shown, Mr. Whitney. Very well. Ebenezer, go get a stock. Baker, you take one of those barrels you've been working on. Evans, you'll need the barrel bands. Cummings, a butt plate. And the rest of you, find the parts you've made and take your places at this bench in order. Oh, oh I don't like Do it. as I say. As for you, Talbot, I give you the honor of picking a prison and putting together the lock assembly. Take anyone. All right, Baker, bed the barrel on the stock. Evans, slip the barrel bands on. You know how they work. Cummings, attach the butt plate in its proper place. Whitbeck, the trigger guard. And now, Talbot, install the lock assembly. mark the time spent in assembly. That is important. How does it look, Captain? It looks like a musket. Will it fire? Joel, some powder and a ball. by hand. If anything goes wrong, look what happened to Talbot. Put it in the vice the way they always do it. Fire it by a string on the trigger. No, Joe. We can't let our friends think we've lost faith in our own work. I'm going to fire it myself. Stand back. That prison can fly to pieces. That barrel hasn't been proof tested. Stand clear, everybody. Perfect target, gentlemen. The calling card you left me. You got it the first time, gentlemen. Well, Captain? I did you an injustice, sir. Before the day is ended, we will have many more like this. In three months, we can make almost any number. Eli, I was wrong. My felicitations. And so, over a century ago, in this little factory on the outskirts of New Haven, Connecticut, was developed the know-how and division of labor we have come to know as mass production, responsible for so much of America's greatness and strength. All due to the imagination, initiative, and daring of a man who rose up and triumphed over ignorance and error. One man, Eli Whitney.